We got him here. Your European Open champion. First off, I got to apologize for not having you on, but you're here with us now. Gannon Burr, how's it going, brother? What's up, guys? Where, where are you in a bathroom right now? Where the heck are you? No, I'm just in, I'm just in the living the kitchen. Oh, okay, okay. All right, all right. It looks like you're just like standing in the bathroom. All right, no. all right. All right. Uh, are you are you in Idaho? What's where are you at right now? Yep, yep. I'm in. Uh, I'm like 30 minutes away from the course. Okay, nice. Um, so you are one of the people that are playing Idaho before Worlds. It looks like that the tournament's kind of a little bit. Uh, a lot of people end up dropping. Yeah, possibly. I, I can definitely see that preparing for Worlds. Um, part of it was, you know, I try to play as many tournaments as I can, but I'm also defending champion, so I yeah. want to see if I can defend my title. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, let's be honest, too. Idaho is a fun course, too. It's a, yeah, it's a gr- for sure. Great course, great, great crowds out there. Really, really fun. I, I would be playing there this week as well, but my back is like, uh, absolutely not. So I'm taking this week off. But uh, let's let's jump into it first. We, we, we'll go back. Because before you came on here, we were kind of discussing a little bit about, I think last time you were on the podcast, AB was the brand new shiny toy. Everyone was like, this is AB's tour. He's the greatest player ever. And now the narrative has completely done like a 180. And now we have people basically saying that the season you're having right now is on pace to be the greatest season of all time. So what what has the season been like for, for you? Yeah, I mean it's been it's been pretty crazy. Obviously, you know, I had uh, three wins last year, so I had some expectations to play pretty good and get some more wins. Uh one thing I didn't do well last year was being in contention that much. I was only I think I think I only podium five times, but I had three wins. And so this year I already have, I think, close to like eight or nine podiums. Uh, and obviously we haven't finished the season yet. And so I'm just giving myself that many more chances to win tournaments. That was my goal coming into the season was, you know, give myself a chance every weekend. Something good I've been doing is, you know, you know, if I'm not in the lead after round one, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed. I know with how I'm playing these days that if I'm feeling confident, I should be able to win any tournament. If I just keep my head in it and uh, hopefully my game is feeling good that week. And even when it doesn't feel good, I've been able to place pretty solid this year. Uh, I mean, I only have that one tournament OTB outside the top 10 this year. Um, But yeah, just, uh, you know, I kind of came into Ledgestone with no expectations. Um, Obviously had to win at European Open. That was huge. And um, to be completely honest, the Estonia tournament, the European Disc Golf Festival was this might sound bad, but like the like least motivated I've been to win a tournament. Mm. Um, you know, I pretty much come in every single weekend feeling super motivated, pretty equally. Obviously the majors are a little more important, uh, but I just, I was so ex- mentally exhausted from, you know, a long stretch of tour. You know, I, I don't, I'm not a person to take breaks when I play on the tour. And so I just finished European open. That was super stressful. And all I want to do is just eat candy and pretty much. And, and I was like, I just got to relax. And, you know, I, I got there obviously still wanting to win, but I think my preparation wasn't very good for that tournament. You know, usually every night I'm stretching before bed, uh, during the tournament, I don't, you know, eat really, I don't, I don't eat unhealthy during the tournament. And, um, that tournament, I, uh, it's a little difficult because the food in Europe's I don't know, kind of confusing sometimes, but uh, <laughs> I, just, I just felt like my, my preparation wasn't as good as it could have been for that tournament. And along with that, I just didn't really, you know, my head wasn't really in the game and it showed the first two rounds. I was in like 27th place after the first two rounds, but I looked at the scores, kind of, kind of calculated it and saw if I shot 12 or 13 out of the final round that I put me, you know, close to a top 10 finish. And I was able to shoot a 1080 rate around to finish my European trip. And so I kind of came back to the US with a, a good feeling, even though it wasn't my best finish, um, actually being my second worst finish of the year. Um, and so I came into Ledgestone, I, I knew I was gonna be tired and I uh, kind of developed a little bit of a cold for the first couple of rounds of Ledgestone and a little bit still dealing uh, dealing with that cold. But um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I feel like I threw a lot of good shots in the first round of Ledgestone, and 
took a couple big numbers. I had a double and then a bow year right after it. And so it went from like a pretty good front nine of a, of a round one, kind of went to a meh round. I was only, I think, one under through 10 holes. And that's like really not good enough if you want to win tournaments. So, you know, I played, I think, a 600 back nine after that to shoot seven under for the first round. Uh, birding the last four holes in the course, which is definitely difficult with 17 being an island hole and 18 is a very difficult hole as well. Uh, so came into that second round, only two off the lead. And, uh, you know, at that point, I actually, for some reason, I just like knew I was going to win the tournament. I just had a great feeling about it. I knew if I just play smooth, steady, simple, stayed in my no game candy. plan. No candy. <laughs> I didn't. Oh, let me tell you this. I had Texas Roadhouse five nights in a row. Oh I had it before gosh. the tournament, and then the four days after the tournament, every single night after my rounds, uh, with my mom. And so that was, and I was keeping it routine. I was just. Uh, What's, are you ordering the same thing every time, or are you getting yeah. something different? Yeah. What's I your go-to order? I just get a twelve-ounce ribeye, medium, and I get a mac and cheese and a baked potato with uh with water to drink that's my meal right. and so right. uh i do have a couple of the rolls i have to admit but um <laughs> you, you kind of have to you know um but yeah so i i went into ledgestone feeling motivated because it felt the feeling of playing bad was so terrible in estonia that i was like i'm never letting this happen again and so i took it serious i, I you know i made sure to stretch every night before the tournament got a good warm-up I went to a field a couple hours before my round every single day, and uh, you know I just had a good routine and uh, went and threw my threw my discs on the lines I kind of envisioned I would on the course, and uh, you know yeah, like I said I, after that first round I just knew I was going to win the tournament. My game was feeling that good. I remember telling my caddy Matt, you know, I felt like I I played a lot better than my score reflected today, and so if I can just keep it clean the next couple of days I should be able to win the tournament. Uh, you know, usually as the more rounds go on, I'm able to stay consistent and kind of let others fall off. Obviously, I play pretty well, but uh, a lot of that is just staying consistent. If you're able to shoot around nine under every single round at a pro tour, you pretty much get top five every single event. And so, yeah, just do that, Yuli. What the heck? Yeah, so easy. <laughs> but obviously, it's a lot harder than that, that sounds. But um, yeah, and then got the wins. That'd be my. Uh, Fifth win of the year. I have one elite, a major, and all the elite pluses so far. Uh, you know, I seem to be performing pretty well if I'm given more rounds, which, you know, that's why I'm looking forward to Worlds uh, for sure. And kind of using Idlewild as a little bit of a, you know, get back to the woods yeah. and, uh, you know, make sure my, my wooded game is, is dialed in. That way I can play the uh, New London pretty solid for Worlds. Um, but, yeah, I mean... My, my game feels great right now. I'm actually confident, which sometimes I wasn't last year. And, uh, you know, like I said, my bad weeks are still pretty good. Well, Gannon, you know I love you, but I say this with all due respect. Sometimes watching you play is really annoying because <laughs> watching your reactions to shots, watching you, like, miss putts, and you're just like, you can, I'm watching. I'm like, oh my God, Gannon's playing terrible. And then you get to hole 18 and they show the leaderboard. And it's like, like the European Open round one. I thought you were in 60th place with how bad you like were playing. And then you look at the leaderboard and you're like, he's in striking distance. Like he's, he's still right in the contention. So what, what is the trick? What is, what is it to where, when you're even playing bad and you know, you're playing bad. Like you, you said it like throughout that entire round one, you're just like off and like, you're just a little bit off here. What is it to that? You're able to do to still stay in a tournament and not shoot yourself out of it. Yeah. So I think one thing is developing a very solid game plan. And I, I so I believe in a weird way, I'm an aggressive player with a safe game plan. If that makes any sense, I don't know. There's certain shots that make sense for me to go for. I've said it before, the, the better player you are, the more aggressive you're allowed to get uh, because your percentages are higher that it's going to work out in your favor. But, you know, especially at a course like Tampa Day for round one at European Open, it's very similar to Northwoods Black where the scoring spread isn't that much. Mm. Um, and so to get birdies out there, you have to throw perfect shots. And so, you know, something I do, I think, is have a very high percentage game plan to where my where my bad shots are pars. Um, I have a pretty low bogey rate while still having birdie 
chances on almost every single hole. I'm leading the field in, I think, throwing this year with circle one and circle two in regulation. So I'm getting more looks than anybody, and I'm not taking that many bogeys. And so obviously you can do the math. That equals a really good under par tournament. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's knowing that like there's pretty much always time. There's always time to get birdies. Uh, I tell you know my <laughs> my my friends, you know if they're if they're not playing great, that like just get more birdies. Jeez, well, that, that, too, that helps a little bit. More but birdies. You can't you can't look at tournaments as like let's say it's a three day tournament. You can't look at it as three different days. You got to look at it at a fifty four hole stretch. You know just because you have you know, a, a bad middle section of a round doesn't mean, you know, you have to wait till the next day to have a new attitude and a, a new point. mindset. Like we're just playing a stretch of 54 holes. Yes. They're on different days, but you can start that good stretch at any time. And so I feel like I've been uh, doing a really good job about doing that never giving up, always keeping my head. In. I tell myself every time, like, you know, I get, I'm allowed to get frustrated, but I can't let that affect my decisions or my play. Uh, make sure that doesn't get changed. Um, and so, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that all just equals good, clean disc golf. And I, and I was talking with my caddy, Matt, again, I was like, I hate the rounds that, that, you know, you have like one blow up hole because you played 17 really good holes for a round. Like I said, it's a stretch of 54 holes, but we'll use a round as an example. You play a stretch of really good holes. And if you look at just your score, I shot seven under round one at Ledgestone. I felt like I shot like an 11 under. I threw like two bad shots that weren't even that bad. I know the, the bridge hole, I thought I threw a perfect shot. I thought I parked it out of my hand. It was in the straight position and it went a foot long OB. And then I threw an OB from the drop zone and I had to make a 50 footer for a double. Like if that's just one foot shorter, I'm three strokes better already. And I don't have to work hard at all. And so it's stuff like that, that really gets under my skin, but you know, you, you can't let it. So that's a, uh, you know, I, I hate rounds like that, basically. So if I create a game plan to where that can't happen, then usually, you know, the big thing is just don't bogey. Dropping strokes just hurts so much on tour. Um, you know, a bogey hurts more than a birdie helps, it almost seems like sometimes. And so, Lutchstone, I was like, well, I'm going to hope my putting's good, but I'm going to play to the safe side on pretty much every hole and play to my strong suits and uh, create a good game plan. And so, you know, most of the time, I think 90% of the time, I was able to execute it and I got the birdies obviously with confidence that helps a lot, but yeah, just keeping your head in the game. Yeah. What you just said is I just watched a tiger woods clip, which I mean, if you're trying to comp yourself with another kind of golfer, tiger woods is a good one to comp with. He said something very similar to what you're saying is when someone was asking like, Hey, how many pins do you attack during a round? He his the answer was so good. He basically was saying like, Listen, I, I'm not, my aim point is not at a lot of pins. I might only go for two or three pins in a round, but my aim point that's 20 feet left of the pin, let's say, I'm attacking that aim point where I think a lot of players and a lot of AMs probably listening, you know, we see the water on the right of the hole. So we're thinking like, oh, I don't want to throw in the water. I'm just going to play safe over to the left. And you're just like playing away from the danger versus picking 20 feet left of the basket and throwing aggressive to the bat to that spot versus throwing cautiously at the basket. And I think that's what you just said is like you play to certain spots, but you play to those spots aggressively. You're yeah, not like, it's you're, very intentional, very yes. intentional. It's like, um, <clears throat> now I did make a little bit of a switch in my game plan on the bridge hole for the final round. I was having a really rough round and there are very, very, you know, limited times that I do this where I do change my game plan and it's very situational, but I was playing pretty bad that final round. I needed to get something going and Ezra had just parked that hole for birdie. He was only three back at that point. And so I told myself I was going to play like 40 left and make a putt, but you know, there's definitely times where I, I try to sometimes either play like a mind game unintentionally, I guess, maybe intentionally, but you know, maybe, you know, stepping up and parking that shot. One thing that was big for me is, Hole 11, I think, was the biggest point in the tournament for myself, was because I had a had a 40 footer right at death. If I miss any part of the basket, I'm out of bounds. Ezra was just inside the circle, which is not a gimme putt whatsoever. And so I thought, you know, I obviously went through the scenarios. If I miss this putt, he makes it. I'm only up two, but if I make it, he makes it. I'm still up four, and if he misses, I might be up five. 
And so what happened was I made my putt super clutch. And so, you know, that just naturally just puts pressure on the other player. And Ezra ended up missing his putt barely low. And then just like that, I was up five with six to play or something like that. And so I could kind of just play my game and kind of cruise in at that point. And so, you know, I try not to change my game plan that much, but you make a very good point of like, yeah, aggressively going at landing zones. Yeah. Um, and so if you, if you do that confidently, it's all intentional instead of, yeah, just like, Oh yeah, we'll saw it off. Cause the water is there. Like, no pick right there. Maybe even circles edge, whatever, go for that spot. And then, you know, stuff like that. Do you have like a, a miss that happens frequently? Like what's like, do you grip lock or do you early release? Which one is more typical because that probably comes into your game plan as well. You know, like, okay, typically I miss yeah. early, so I'm going to be aiming a little wider. Or typically I pull it, so I'm going to be aiming a little inside. Like, uh, what is if you have one, maybe you're so dialed you don't even have a miss right now, but. I'd say, like, for my whole game generally, I don't have a specific miss. Maybe my backhand, uh, it kind of depends where I'm at. If I'm in the woods, my backhand miss is usually a grip lock right because I, I kind of go through that, like, you know, all right, so don't grip block it. And I'm like, wait, also don't throw it left. And so I go back to the grip lock. And so uh, when I'm off in the woods, I, I tend to be pulling stuff a little bit. I just get I get scared to early release. That's like my biggest fear. Uh, it just means you like zero commitment. At least with the grip lock, eh, whatever. It's a little more committed, I guess. Still not a good shot. Yeah. But uh, in the open, I think I just miss everywhere. Like, not there's not a specific area I miss. I think it's, uh, I think it's kind of just all around where I'm aiming. But uh, I think you know my my form this year has been really good about pulling through nice and flat. Uh, and so I kind of preset whatever angle I want, which makes the angle easy. And then all I have to do is hit the line. And so uh, it's been it's been a you know I don't have to think too hard when I when I throw. I kind of just pick my pick my aiming points, have my mental cues, and just commit. Nice. All right. We got to talk about it. Trevor made a post on Twitter that kind of sparked up a lot. I don't know if you ended up seeing that tweet or not, Gannon, but he basically was saying that uh, the pace that you're on right now could very well be one of the greatest, if not the greatest seasons of all time in disc golf. And that obviously sparked up a lot of, uh, you know, back and forth. And a lot of people were bringing up, 2015 Paul's career where he went on that crazy stretch of wins and whatnot. So I know you, you know, you, you're, you love disc golf. You, you know, you, you probably have gone back and watched tons and tons of coverage. So if Gannon Burr was right now picked up and thrown back a decade in 2015, how do you think you would fare in that field? Um, I, I, I'm not sure about the wins, but I think I would pretty much podium every event. Now, like I said, I'm not sure about the wins, but for sure, like, I don't think I'd ever finish outside the top 10 or even come close to it. Do you think too, like, um, it, it, like looking at, looking at the players back then versus now, do you think it's like, you know, easier for you to have maybe a bat because do you think you could basically, do you think you could win a tournament right now? If you're, if you're not playing your best. Uh, yeah. Right. Right now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and back then do you, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it'd be the same answer. Yeah, probably. Cause like, I mean, examples of me playing where my game feels good was Ledgestone in Portland and I won by seven and eight. So when my game feels really good, I feel like I'm able to kind of pull away. Mm -hmm. uh, when my game feels not amazing, I remember I, you know, I was able to win the, the Beaver State Fling this year. I won by one stroke, but my game didn't really feel that good. But I, uh, I kind of was able to kind of lock in and, and uh, you know, get the birdies when I needed them to get the, get the win by one there. Um, you pretty much always have to, you know, eventually pull up a clutch shot in those scenarios. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, if I'm looking at – if you look back in the, you know, the recent years before that, I don't know too much about like 2016 or 2017, but you know, I think Ricky in the most recent time, I think 2022, Ricky had five pro tour wins. One of them being the pro tour finals. Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't have a major that year. And so I'm already past that. Um, and that's the best, I think in the, you know, the last seven, eight years, the best season so far. So I think I definitely have a chance to, 
you know, get close to that Paul McBeth season, I think I'm, I might need another major, uh, at least get a couple. I think two more wins would definitely give me a, a good shot at it. I mean, having seven wins in a year with the field we have these days is pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's still tournaments, a lot of tournaments left and a lot of them are more rounds. So hopefully, you know, what I've been doing continues, uh, obviously no guarantees, but from what we've seen so far, it's been helping me a lot to have more rounds. But, you know, I look back at a couple of the tournaments, Paul won. The Aussie Open had six players over 1,000 rated. You know, that's like a that's like a B tier these days in terms of how many 1,000 rated players are over. Obviously, it was Ricky, it was Eagle, it was uh, Dave Felberg back then. So there were still the top players were there, but nowadays – it's not always the top players that win. You can have people coming from, yeah. you know, 10, 20 rated and, and win and win in pro tours. And so, you know, it's not a guarantee, obviously, and it doesn't happen that often. But when you add just like 50 more players around that skill level, a few of them pop off every single week, no matter what. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's just, I, I don't really understand the debate. I know people don't, people have their favorites and they want to like, you know, push them up and whatnot, but there is no debate on like, is the skill level better now than it is back then? It, it is better. I mean, the field's deeper, the top players are better. It, it is what it is. Um, with that being said, it's you a did tough say comparison, no matter what, it, it's going to be a tough comparison. The, the only reason why, the only reason I disagree with you though, Gannon is like, it's tough to compare now in like Ken Climo. Right, because there is no yeah, really, yeah. there is no crossover. Paul, Ricky, um, Simon. There's a lot of guys that were playing in 2015. Is not that far away from 2025, and it's not like it's not like Paul, Ricky were like at the end of their career in 2015, and now they're like a shell of themselves. Like we're gonna have Ricky on here, and I'm gonna ask him like, do you think you're yeah. playing the best disc golf you've ever played? And you know, if he says yes, I mean, that shows you something because he was winning a bunch back then. So, um, I, I don't, yeah, that, that, I that's think just, Ricky's definitely better now. Yeah, I, I, I like, agree. I think, I think he's so. definitely better now than he was. Yeah. I, I, yeah, no, I, I think so too. Um, but you said in an interview, you said that you want to become the goat of disc golf. What, like, what do you think you have to do to like put that stamp that Gannon Burr is the, the greatest disc golfer of all time? Uh, got to win a lot of majors and you got to be consistent for at least a decade. I feel like, you know, you can't just kind of play for five years. You got to definitely be very, very active in, in disc golf, you know, for as long as you can. Uh, so, you know, I already have two majors that helps a lot. Hopefully I can kind of stay at the same rate I'm on, you know, at least a major every two years. That way by the end, end of my career, I have, you know, five to 10 majors. Obviously, that's not near as much as Paul or Ken Climo, but it's it's very difficult to win these days, and I can't imagine how hard it's going to be to win in ten years. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, Yuli, did you have anything? I did have one more question yeah. for Gannon. Yeah, when we're talking about like the best seasons of all time, you you brought up that like Ricky season for when he won. What did he win five times Pro Tour Championship? Yeah, but, yeah. But when we're talking about like best players like don't you guys hang your hats on like major championships so wouldn't the best year ever be when Macbeth won every single major and this didn't he do that he won every major in the season and when wasn't it five yeah he won five majors one season so when so i just have to yeah, that's crazy. i have to put a, I have to kind of put a stop to like when we're talking about greatest seasons of all time no matter the era when you get five majors there's no there's no debate. You know what I mean? Let's say you lose every single pro tour the whole season, but you win all five majors. Is there a debate in your opinion? Wouldn't a bet your best season ever, you would have to win like all the majors. So is that a goal of yours? Yeah. Like, get yeah. Them all. like next season, I, like mean, I, I got to get them all for sure. For sure. It's just, it's so tough. I mean, it's a, uh, it's slightly hard to compare, uh, just because you know nowadays it's it's so hard to win five majors. It, oh, it's like almost impossible. Back then, you know, it's it's really just has to do with the the strength of the field, and so there weren't a ton of players to to beat back then. Obviously, there's still I, I mean what probably at least ten really really good players. 
Uh, but, I mean, yeah, Paul Paul was definitely on another level that year. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty honored that people are, you know, kind of at least just put me in the conversation, talking about Absolutely, it a little bit. Yeah. Um, but, you know, now if I were to, if I were to win USDGC and Worlds, then I think there's a pretty oh, good a argument for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Then I, then I think it's, you know, it could definitely rival it, maybe even beat it. Uh, but, um, yeah, you know, this, this, this technology hasn't really evolved that much, you know, so we're playing with about the same equipment. Uh, obviously courses have got a little more difficult. But, uh, you know, I think the only disc we've really received in the last 10 years is like an overstable approach. Uh, other than that, I feel like the equipment is pretty much the same. Yeah, the Captain Raptor, I mean, kind of changed the game. It's crazy. <laughs> the <Yeah>. only... <laughs> the, no, the you, the, 100% gaining. You're, you're right on track with that. Yeah, the only the only thing that I... I, I when, when I'm talking about this, and I've talked about this many, many times before... It's it has nothing like Paul can only beat the people in the field. That, yeah. That's all he can do. Um, but when you really look at it, and like if I if I insert myself into this equation, and I and I and I kind of give an analogy of like ultimate frisbee. Ultimate frisbee was not a D one sport. Ultimate frisbee is not paying anyone uh, a crap ton of money to where they can just do it. Like everyone still has. There's nine to five jobs, and then they show up on the weekends and play tournaments that way. If Ultimate all of a sudden s switched and became a D1 sport and people were making hundreds of thousands of dollars, I would be lucky to sniff the field, right? And so, like, to me, that's – when I look back at, like, 2015, I look now, 2015, a lot of people weren't playing full-time. A lot of people had jobs. A lot of people were on tour like, hey, this is a fun thing to do. I can I can just kind of go from tournament to tournament. Like we are now seeing kids basically decide not to go to college and go all in on disc golf. I, I just think it's too – like you almost can't compare the two because they're so different. You can't. They're, they're just so different. And, and that's where it's just like – the people that are like, well, Gannon has to win all all four majors in a season to actually be legit. It's like, do you realize how hard it is to win one major now? Well, I mean, it's I think it's, it's been it's, I think it's been hard to do that, period. Because there's only been done once, I I believe. So it's but, not well, like it was but, easy. But, ever. but the thing but the thing is, Yuli, like what like do you think right now if you went and played every C tier in the Charlotte area that you would win a lot of them? Yeah. So is that impressive? Would you no. consider that impressive? No fun. Absolutely. That, but that's that's kind of my that's kind of my argument though. Is like, we're, but we're not talking about C tiers, so we can we can scratch that comparison. We're talking about but, ma but, we're talking about major championships. And let me make this point. But you how many people compare, can win a tournament? You can't compare eras. What we're saying is who has the best season ever. If you don't lose, how are you? Like that's a great season. But then somebody who later on does something else, like you still have to be like, well, I mean, somebody did it, did it this way. So for his era, we can have eras for sure. Best yeah. of his era, best yeah. of this era, absolutely. But I think I my, my my only argument, my my, and people are getting people are getting real quick. I have to defend my my take here because people are getting confused in the uh, the chat. When you go to a C tier, Yuli, you're expected to win. Why? Because you're the best player there, and no, and there's not that many other people that can even, if they play great, can beat you. There are a lot of people that can pop off and can win tournaments now, and there was a lot less of those people back in 2015. Do, do we that's, expect that's all I'm to saying. win every single weekend? I do at this point. Do you? I, would, I don't think I would. No, I don't think I, could, I would expect him to win every weekend. No. Right. There's too there's too many people. There's just too many people. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that's, of different that, winners every single that's all. year, right? If, Especially if, right now, we have AB who's won four, Simon's won one, if, if Gannon, Ricky's won a few, Calvin, yeah. Gannon, and if of Gannon's course, all playing, the way across the board. And if Gannon's playing, I, if Gannon's playing Idlewild this week, and Ricky isn't there, Eagle isn't there, AB isn't there, Paul isn't there, and all of a sudden you have a bunch of people that aren't there, am I expecting Gannon to win? Yeah. Because there's less people that can win. That's my only argument. Is like 
there are 30 plus people right now that can win on tour. They're I get that. But when we when we talk about majors in any era, like we can't we can't just be like, that ah, was like a C tier back then, or it was a smaller tournament, or these players weren't any good. It's major championships. It's major championships. It's the hardest thing to win every single era across the board all the way but, until the end of time. Can we agree though that it's different though? That's all I'm saying. It's different. It's different because people get better. I mean, at, when Gannon's, no, re, when Gannon's no. re, retired and done, yeah. there's going to be people who are better than him. But, okay. I, I, my only, it, it's in every sport. In every sport, there's massive growth and there's massive change in every sport. And people are willing to look back and say, like, that is a different sport that was being played back then than yeah, now. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's all that I'm saying. One one billion percent that's different courses, different. Yeah, the players. skill level that you needed back then is not the same skill level that you need now. No. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Gannon, you got some input. Yeah, like, Gannon, what do you have yeah. to say about that, Gannon? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I was just saying, like, if I so if I obviously you know for Paul's first four World Championships and all of Ken's World Championships, you know, you had what was it like seven rounds? about sometimes they had nine i think back in the day nine okay yeah so, so it was like nine i, I mean, played worlds with now, seven six yeah i'm not i'm not sure if it's a great comparison but it's just an idea i had you know if, if i if i had to play just ricky ab and calvin every single weekend you know i i i like my i like my chances and if that's yeah. like the only people in the field and you play you know, a lot more rounds, um, you know, cause if, if one of them messes up, there's not really a ton of people to kind of step in, in their place and, you know, take that, take that win basically, you know, these days, you know, with a couple of the wins I, I do have that, you know, I didn't play my best disc golf and I was still able to get the win. Yeah. You know, back in the day, I still might've won by like eight strokes, even if I didn't play my best disc golf now. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. That's that's about all I have. It's just I feel yeah. like if I was put up against a couple players and those are the only players that could maybe rival me, I feel like I'd win about twenty five percent or half the tournaments. But we're acting like there's a lot of different players winning. The Presno won. Who else won? Prolific winners on the tour. The people there's a that, lot like, of the there's five, a lot the same five guys. There's a lot of people that can yeah, win though. That's a good point. That's, they, they can win. How? They haven't proven it. What do you mean they can win? You they're they're close to winning. They're 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 close to winning. What do you mean? What are you talking about? I'm talking about the people who are winning right now. Yeah. Yeah. Are the good players. Presnell snuck one in. Major champion. Okay. okay. Who else? Simon, Calvin, Ricky, Gannon. You're beating the same guys. N A B. You're beating the same guys every single week. I feel like there's been more winners this year. Who else? Am I, am I crazy? There's this year. Yeah. There's not that many, I guess. Because everybody, those guys are just handling the field. <laughs> Last year, there was definitely more winners, right? Yeah. A few. Si Simon won a lot of those. I oh, think. you forgot Nicholas, who's won twice, get wrecked. Nicholas. You forgot, you forgot Paul Macbeth. Macbeth hasn't won this year. Um, Nicholas has, and we have some European at? winners. What am I sure. looking at right here, dude? There, how is there not like an easy way to see all the winners? <laughs> Gannon knows. Gannon am follows I, all the stats. I am, I, I am I crazy I, right hit now? Us, hit us. Shouldn't won? that be? Shouldn't that be? Shouldn't there be a link that I can just see the winners there of every tournament? Be, yes. What, without, what, without, what, without am I right now? It's Nicholas. Al Klein. Al Klein has won this year. We should go the last two years. Uh, why? To be fair. What? Why? Because the full season hasn't happened yet. We live in the now, bro. But we haven't we haven't had a full <laughs> season. Matty O won. James Proctor won. What are we talking about here, Yuli? There's tons of people that can win. Come on. We're talking about this season. Tons maybe of maybe the players have gotten better this year too. Tons the same guys are winning. I do like this Brian take. Uh, prime Climo would get in Gannon's head. I do like that. <laughs> I do like that take. I do like that take. We uh, asked I guess, Gannon. We asked Gannon who won, and he bounced. Yeah, he's, he got <laughs> he got scared. 
<laughs> See, I don't want to. I don't want to list all these I'm people. Back. I'm back. Um, I'm back. All right, name the winners. He knows everything. He's a statistician. Statistician. Okay. Can you? All know? right. Uh, I'm. A, I'm just gonna count the United States, at least here's the majors, and then the uh, three over in Europe that were kind of on the main, the main tour. Oh wow! Shout out to we Jesse Niedemann. Myself, Anthony Barella. Huh? Yeah, I, I, I mean. I got it right here with a- Edwin Stats. I'm going to go off like... A.B., Niklas, okay. Ricky, Calvin, Proctor, Hello? Prez, Simon, and Yessi. Gannon. Gannon. My internet's so bad. I don't know what happened to well, it. Well, here's the thing, Gannon. You did great. Everyone loved you. That's all that matters. That's all we'll remember. We will not remember how bad your internet is or that you did this interview in a bathroom. Um... <laughs> But we always do appreciate you jumping on here, <laughs> Gannon. And uh, I, I guess we, we all expect you to win this week, so no pressure. Uh, I'll try my best. No expectations. All right, brother. Go out there, have fun, and uh, we'll see you up in Virginia in a few. All right, thanks. Thanks.